We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Our special guest today is Licky Labji. He's a colleague and a friend that I deeply respect. We met at Heroic Public Speaking. He's the BSN, not the Bachelor of Science and Nursing, but he's the Blind Spot Navigator. He's the founder and president of the Vancouver, British Columbia-based Dante Group, and he's this in-demand workshop leader, an amazing keynote speaker. He's passionate about helping people find their potential, and he just owns the room when he's addressing a group. He is also the author of a new book called Death by BS, which has become the number one bestseller on Amazon. Welcome to ROG, Licky. Shannon, thank you very much. It's an incredible pleasure to be here with you. Likewise, always a pleasure to get to see you and connect with you. You're one of those people that I consistently feel excited to connect with. If I know I have a call with you or if I'm going to see you on one of our group calls, it's energizing. So thank you for being that for us. Same goes for you as well. We connected really well at HPS and the friendship has uh, flourished into something else now and I love it. I know. I'm so grateful. So tell us a little bit about you, Licky. Give us some of your background. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I call myself a recovering entrepreneur. And I say that sheepishly because this is, this is my eighth go at a business and uh, eighth great business runs. And the largest one was an IT company that I had for 25 years, which I sold off about seven years ago. When I did that, it was an interesting journey to end up where I am today. I thought I was in IT, but I guess I was actually in coaching and speaking and helping people all the time. And uh, this is now exactly where I've landed is where I want to be at. I just waking up every morning and getting a chance to really work with people on a one on one basis in teams. It's funny, I was uh, riding my bike last year with my wife and I had this big, huge grin on me. And she goes, oh, you're really happy you're cycling with me. I go, I am happy I'm cycling with you. But I just realized I'm waking up every morning loving what I do and transforming teams. And she goes, oh, OK. I'm glad I'm cycling with you. <laughs> That's terrific. Congratulations. And I'm sure after selling that business, you had a moment of time where you maybe didn't have purpose or you didn't know what's next or how do I channel my talents now that I'm not doing this business ownership anymore, now that I'm not leading this business anymore. Yeah, I know. That hit me on the eighth day. I was actually sitting in Mexico on a hammock and I woke up on the eighth day with no purpose. And that hit me hard. So what did you do? Well, I phoned up a good friend of mine, Bob Berg, at the, the Go-Givers. He's the author of the book called The Go-Givers. He's been a great mentor. And I kind of chatted with him. And he goes, well, why don't you come down and become a certified coach and a speaker for us? And uh, that's where the journey started about really finding myself. That's incredible. Yes, and such a great book. And ironically, someone gifted me that book soon after I decided that my purpose is to talk about generosity. And then someone unknowingly gave me The Go-Giver. Terrific book. And it makes a lot of sense that you're a go-giver speaker and coach. So take us back a little bit further in the life of Licky Labji. Talk to us about like where you grew up and the places that you've moved to as a young man? Let me go back to the, the question you asked me earlier about what did I realize after I sold the IT company? When I went to see Bob Berg, when he asked me to become a speaker, my first hesitation was, yeah, I can't become a speaker. And he goes, why is that? I said, well, I have a stutter. And he goes, yeah, I kind of hear that. He goes, well, you can still be a coach for us. And if you don't want to be a speaker, that's fine. But it was that workshop that he had asked me to attend. And that was literally, I went from Mexico to Orlando to visit him for three days. And we did it, sat through a workshop. And on the third day, he does an exercise and he asked me to stand up. And he acknowledged me for my traits. Like you're a gentle human being, you're kind, you're loving, you're very trustworthy. And I'm excited to have you part of our team. And Kathy, his business partner, gets up and says very similar things, yet different. And then the third person, the fourth person, and by the fifth person, I was actually in tears. And Bob looks at me and goes, what's going on? And I said, I've never heard these words before. And he kind of just chuckled a bit. He goes, I wonder if you've never heard these words before. You've really, really listened to these words before. And he goes, go ahead and just listen to the words that the rest of the people say. And by the 10th person, I had the sense of relief come over me. 
That evening, I was on the flight back from Orlando to Dallas-Fort Worth. I was talking to this passenger for about two hours, and I realized it was without a stutter. Now, I'd gone through 30 years of therapy to get rid of the stutter because I knew I didn't have it when I was born. It wasn't a physical issue. It was, it was something else. But we just couldn't figure out what it was. So I get home that evening. I tell my wife this. And she kind of chuckles and she goes, great. So it took 10 strangers to tell you what I've been telling you for years. And your friends have been telling you for years. You're actually a pretty cool guy. I go, okay, I, I get it. I get it. But then I had to do some real hard work to figure out why that one moment changed. So I went on a self-discovery path. And that landed me to this, the question he asked for me about what was I doing at 10 years old? Well, I immigrated to Canada. My teacher had asked me to stand up in front of my class and share my immigration story. At 10 years old, who cares? You get up there and you start talking. Now, English wasn't my first language. So I get up there and the kids started laughing. And one kid actually yelled, go back to where you came from. And I didn't make much of it. But then a couple more kids started yelling that. I looked at the teacher and he just shrugged, didn't know what to say. So I just sat in my chair and, again, 10 years old, Licky doesn't belong here. He's not good enough. And that's when the life of Licky with a stutter started. That was in grade four, I guess it was. And then grade seven, grade eight, I had challenges with bullying. And grade nine, it was just really difficult. Uh, by grade 10, I got into a bad, a wrong path. In grade 11, I dropped out of high school. Uh, but what that created for me was the push of creating something for myself and just going out and doing it. I didn't belong in school. The narrative I've been telling myself is I'm a high school dropout. But now the narrative is I didn't belong in school. I had to change the way I learned. And I did it that way. But the life of Licky without a stutter started by really listening to the people that had something good to say about me. And that was my blind spot. That's, that's allowed me to create what I want to create now, just helping people find their blind spots. So you have transitioned this life experience into a purpose of helping people discover their blind spots, helping them to realize their potential. And that's really profound. I mean, there's so much in that story, Licky. Thank you for offering that to us to uncover for ourselves. So one of the things I'm thinking in light of generosity is the generosity of inclusion and the generosity of how we affect other people. I wonder even if that's a blind spot for some people that they just don't ever give themselves a break or credit for anything. It's funny. Uh, human nature says we don't know how to receive the good that comes our way. We can receive bad all the time, but when the good comes our way, we deflect. And that's just human nature. And I use an example. You go out for dinner and there's four of us and all four of us want to fight for that bill to pay for it. Well, that means three people are getting hurt because all, everybody wants to pay for it. So you have to learn to receive. And that's, that was my biggest opening is that learning to receive anything that comes my way, good, bad, or indifferent, but hearing the words and then choosing what I want to do with it, creating the narrative that I want to do with it, choosing the perception I want to put against it. And that's that shift in my life that's happened. That simplicity is so profound. I just hope everybody can take that in. So you're a really generous person. Here you are fighting for the bill at dinner, you know, offering the positive feedback when you're witnessing somebody do something that you know they're vulnerable about, all of those things. What are some ways that you have witnessed generosity at work? You know, um, one that really stands out for me is back in 2009, uh, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at that point, uh, we had um, a five-year-old and a 10-year-old. And our daughter was uh, playing softball and needed to get to practices. And, you know, that was a bit of an awakening for us, is family is important. So I actually took six months off of work. Um, I, had, I had my IT company at that point. I only had one technician at that point. I said, look, I need to step away. You need to run this the way. So whatever you need to do, just put the fires out. I'm going to spend time with my family. What was interesting was one of the local mums took it upon herself to send an email to all of our friends and said, I'm putting a bin outside the LavG home. Please drop off food whenever you can. And here's a list of food. And there'll be another bin for the dirty dishes. I'll get them picked up. We don't want the LavGs to worry about this. And literally, the meals for lunch, dinners were all taken care of. But what was really shocking was on a Friday morning, the door is knocking. And I had just gotten up. I had my robe on. I go downstairs. And there's these two neighbors of ours with buckets. And I go, hi. And they go, um, 
can you just move over? We're, we're here to clean your house. And I was blown away. They just showed up and said, look, you've been busy. We've seen you running around being the mother, being the father, being the driver. You need to just take some time for yourself. And we're here to help you clean the house. And that, that's generosity. So what that did for me was we need to make a change for cancer. So I did a, something called a shave off. So uh, a shave off and a pie throwing contest at one of my client sites. Uh, we said, you know, we'll just raise $5,000, right? So I sent an email out to all my customers. And this is at 10 o'clock at night. The next morning I woke up and I had $7,000 guaranteed for, of pledges. It was incredible. But Shannon, if you remember, I said I took six months off of work that year. When I finished that year, we went to see the accountant to see how we're going to manage. And he kind of looked at me and goes, you realize this is the best year you've ever had in business. And I said, what? He says, this is the best year you've ever had. So we went back and looked at our what happened. And every single customer that we had given to gave back to us and said, all the proposals like he offered us, let's just do them. He needs the help. We're going to do it anyways. Let's just do it. That is exactly what we all need to hear is that you don't give to get. I, I do not believe that for most people, the intent is not for paybacks and reciprocity. But the reality is that that's how it works. That's the cycle of giving. That's what I think it means to be a human. And absolutely what it means to be a leader is to be of service, to be willing to contribute to others, to invest in the well-being and the potential in other people. And I think your example is so terrific because here it is, your neighbors recognizing a need because that that's the key point I heard in your story is they saw a need and they inserted themselves. You didn't ask for it. In some cases, you may not have even wanted them showing up at your door at Friday morning, <laughs> ready to clean your home, but you allowed them to be of service to you. And then it just felt so good. And you poured that out into your charity. I mean, a terrific example of the ripple effect. Thanks, Shannon. But one of the biggest keys in, in what you said as well, and I want to just clarify this. Yes, we have to give, but if we're not receiving the chain of giving drops, because if we're all in a circle, just giving, well, there's no longer a circle because nobody's receiving anything. You, you can't give to anybody. So somebody has to receive. And that's one of the biggest learnings I've had is that you can't just be a giver. You have to also learn to receive. When we come back, Licky teaches us how to receive. Introducing the brand new QuadPod Podcast Network. We're adding new podcasts every day. Visit QODPOD.com and meet our podcasters. That's QODPOD.com. And we're back with more from Licky Lavji, the blind spot navigator. Yes. Tell us more about that, Licky, because I have a feeling that for many of us, that's a challenge. Well, like I said um, earlier, is that the words that came my way, I had a hard time hearing those words. And if somebody wants to do something for you, it's okay to allow that to happen. Somebody wants to come and give you whatever or do whatever they want to do. They want to do it. There's no ulterior motive. And we always put our guards up and saying, okay, why are they doing that? What's in it for them? Well, sometimes people just want to do what they want to do and it's okay. And in, especially in the, in the workplace, when we're giving and we're not receiving, and when I say about receiving, it's not just receiving good. It's also receiving criticism. It's also receiving uh, ways to get better. We should just learn from all of that. And the more we learn, the more we can be present to ourselves. Uh, people want to give and they want to be able to do that. And my biggest thing is if I was to ha ha put my hand out right now to you and you didn't have it open, I'm just left hanging. I can't be a giver anymore. There was a point I remember uh, as I was growing up, I had a, one of my best friends and we used to go out a lot and I used to just take care of the bill. Just recently, and I say recently, is like in the last seven to eight years, he, you know, we went, we went out and he kind of puts his hand on me. He goes, okay, enough of this. I need to take care of the bill now. I can and I want to. I have appreciated you doing it. You don't need to anymore. And that really hit me is that he actually wanted to do it so that he can pay back and feel good about himself. Now, if I would have said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, that would have really hurt him. And what was your intent in covering the bill all this time? Well, I, he was going through school. He was, he was having challenges. And we had, I, it was never an issue that I'm always paying. It was, I never even thought of it that way. 
the only time it came up was when he said enough. And I didn't even, I didn't, didn't even, it was just a natural thing for me. But every time I did that, it affected him. He felt bad. Isn't that so interesting? That's a great awareness and a subtle lesson, but a profound lesson. So one of the things that you often say is that there's layers beneath the human behavior, right? There's stuff going on beneath the surface. I often think of people like an iceberg, not in the temperature sense, but more in the sense that there's only a little part of you that I get to see and then this mass beneath the surface. I know you believe that too. What have you learned all this time? You've been a student of and a leader of human behavior, helping organizations grow, teams develop, humans, humans become their best selves. What are some things that you've learned about these layers? Well, that's great. You know, and I love that analogy because I say anything above the water is great. You get to see it. If people are just present, but everything below that waterline is the hidden potential of people. It's just buried. Now let's just find a way of getting it out. And the more you talk to people, the more they understand what they're, and I say BS navigator because it is the BS that's in the way. It's a blind spot or whatever you want to call it for B- BS stands for, but it really is that's in the way. The more we look at our own blind spots, the more we become self-aware ourselves, that hidden potential just grows. And when I go into teams and I work with teams and we start looking at that hidden potential of the people, wow, you see that team flourish. And it's just incredible. Now now you talk about that iceberg, you can see the whole thing. But yet there's that small, but yet there's a small layer that stays underneath because you want that challenge each time. What else is out there? What else is out there? And you keep on looking for it. How does that segue into the title of your book, Death by BS? What's the consequence of not looking beneath the surface? This was a a book title that really hit me because if I hadn't looked for my own blind spots and put my BS aside, I'd be in 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 a bad spot right now. When I hit depression eight years ago and the anxiety was taking over, I could have chosen to go a different path. And that's why it really was the death of me if I didn't choose this path to try and resolve some of these blind spots. And then I sit back and I look at the coach, the, the coaching that I've done with clients and I look at the blind spots that they're going through and by pinpointing them, their hidden potential comes out. And what I realized was that there's nobody there telling them that they have blind spots because as you know, blind spots are seen by others right away, just not seen by yourself. Yes. Yes. And I've heard you describe it as an analogy that you often use when you're driving and you look at your blind spots, you look in your mirrors, you know, you're checking it out to make sure that you don't hit anyone or before you change lanes. But we don't do that so much in our lives. What is the reason for that? What have you discovered or what do you intuitively believe is the reason why we don't check our blind spots about ourselves? Well, it's, it's, it's really it's really simple. You know, when we learned how to drive, we went to driving school and they taught us how to look for blind spots. Well, when we were brought up, Nobody sat down and said, you have to look for blind spots. They, we just created them. It's, it's a real simple analogy. We were told to look for that. So we started looking for, for them. And in life, nobody told us to do it. But it's interesting, the generation now, like, and I say more now, in the last 18 months, uh, especially with what's, what's happening in the world, a lot of people have gotten self-aware. And they're looking deeper and deeper at themselves. Things have changed for them. They've realized what's important. And things are coming out. And they're able to be a little bit more self-aware. And they're looking for that. Teams are transforming because they're looking for this. There's, there's a disconnect right here. There was a disconnect last March. People were working from home. They didn't know what to do. They had to find a new way of getting together. And now we're all getting into some kind of a normalcy. People are getting back into some kind of a workforce environment. And now they don't know how to manage that. Now they're working even harder to figure that out. What is the consequence of us not looking at our blind spots about ourselves? If I take it literally, my book says it perfectly, death by BS. Because if you don't look for your own blind spots, others see them and you'll start disengaging from others or they'll start disengaging from you because of some of those blind spot behaviors. Now, I'm not saying all blind spots are bad. There are good blind spots as well. We just don't know that. So it's understandably, we start looking for them. Like I'm, on a, I'm on a journey every morning looking for my own blind spots. I just know I have to because it's, 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 it's a routine. You get up, you do your meditation, like what's your blind spot? <laughs> it's just a routine. But it's not a normal behavior for a lot of, a lot of us. And when I did some coaching uh, last year, it would take two or three conversations to really build that trust so they would allow me to call out the blind spots and then get them to talk about the blind spots. As you know, we released a, uh, an assessment uh, middle of last year. And that assessment 
allows us to get right into the conversation about blind spots because this is a piece of paper that's non-intrusive. You don't need to build trust with it. It just tells you what your potential blind spots are. Now we can go straight into a conversation. And that's where life has really changed for myself, my teams, and the clients that I work with. The other big blind spot, and this is a big one that hit me, was I'll start projects, but I won't finish them. And that, and I come across as flighty. Now, interesting, I love starting projects. I love, I'm a visionary. I just don't like doing the work in between, but I like to see the end result. So now I just work with my team and they realize that. And before it was like, oh, here goes Licky again, and especially in the IT world. Oh, here goes Licky with a new project. I didn't know that that's what I, that the way I came across. Now I just say, look, I, I want to try this project. What do you guys think? Because I know I, I come across as flighty. I know I come across as starting all these different projects. I want to just throw this on the table and see, what do you guys think? You just become aware of your own blind spots. And that's the big thing. So I'm aware I have a hard time receiving. So the moment somebody says something good to me, I have to take a deep breath and acknowledge it. And don't retaliate because I'm so good at deflecting and joking about it. I just sit back and say, thank you. That meant a lot to me. Yes. Uh, terrific. Simple and accessible and so helpful. So individuals can take this assessment for free. It's 14 questions. Super simple. You immediately get an email and then a report, a PDF report. And it identifies what your strengths are. It starts off with what are the strengths of this style. And then it says your potential blind spots. That's a great segue to one of your favorite quotes by Thomas Cooley. And the quote is, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Talk to us about that. A lot of us think we are who we are. But interesting enough, we actually respond and act the way people think we are. So, you know, um, I can use an example. My friend thinks that I'm successful. So in front of him, I act successful. Or my friend thinks that, you know, when I walk into a room, there's, you know, licking these little bit of uh, coddling. So I'll pretend or I'll, I'll start acting that way. We become the way we think people are looking at us. My narrative of a high school dropout. So there's a friend of mine who always brings it up. Yeah, yeah, you didn't go to high school. So in front of her, I have to pretend and be the person of what she thinks. Whereas with everybody else, I am who I am. I look at this and said, I am who I think you think I am. No, I am who I am. And it, interesting enough that, you know, we've talked about imposter syndrome. We went through a, a nine month course and it was all about imposter syndrome showing up for us at, at speaking. And why is there imposter syndrome? We have a great story to tell. We have an imposter syndrome because what we think people think of us, that's it. So let's put that aside. What suggestions do you have for people who are ready for that step, who have heard what you're saying and recognize that they have blind spots and not making them wrong? That's something I'm hearing you say loud and clear. They're not bad. This isn't something to be ashamed of. This is really normal. It's going to require some vulnerability, some willingness to be curious about the things that we do and the things that we think. So all of this very normal and they're ready to rewrite the narrative. What, what would you recommend that people do? Easy. Give me a call. I'll help you through it. That's the simple thing. But <laughs> yeah, true. No, just being aware that there is a narrative that needs to be changed. Just first of all, just sitting back and just realizing why is it that you have this narrative? Why is it that I call myself a high school dropout? Yet I had eight successful companies. So I'm not a dropout. I just have to learn differently. I had to change my narrative. And the moment I changed it, life started changing. We have to realize we've written a narrative based on our perceptions from the past. And that's what the blind spot is. It's the misinterpretation of our perceptions where the blind spots lie. But it's a narrative that pushes us to create something. And then it's the pressures from parents. It's the pressure from society. I have to go to high school. I have to do this. My son is going through the same path as I am. And I look at him and say, bang on, do what you want to do. And the moment somebody says, well, you're not going to university? Actually, I am going to university of life. I'm trying to figure myself out. Oh, that's such a great encouragement. Recognize your strengths. Acknowledge that you have so much beneath the surface that we probably don't even know about ourselves. So get curious, get in the game, be willing to do that work, that self-exploration work, work with people like you, read your book, take that assessment, dig in or get some data and then start to configure, how could I channel that? 
you know, what's something productive that I could do with this set of strengths that I've been given? Yeah. Sean, I'd love to end with this uh, analogy I've been working on, or just a narrative I've been saying to myself for the last little while regarding leaders. And especially in the last 18 months, uh, there's been this shift of leadership realizing what they need to be doing. And what's really happening finally, and I say finally, is that leaders are realizing that it's about looking at people's hidden potentials and leading the people and not the company. You lead the people, you work with the people and work with them and finding out exactly who they are, what they need, and be there for the people that you have. Your leadership skills go up so often, and so by so many levels, and you become this incredible leader. And this organization just shifts at that point, and the people within that organization shift as well. Yes. Lead the people, not the company. So where can people find you? Where can you direct our listeners to find out more and get connected? The best is my website, uh, LickyLavG.com. So your website is L-I-K-K-Y-L-A-V-J-I.com. And on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn. So LickyLavG.com has our assessment, has the book on there as well. Um, it has a way of getting a hold of me. And part of what I love to do is just having conversations with people. If you're, you're starting to become aware that you have a blind spot, reach out. Let's, let's have a conversation. That's, that's, that's my way of just giving back and saying, let's just have a conversation and see where you're at. Thank you for being you. Thank you for just always driving things forward and for making us feel comfortable to discover our blind spots in a really safe and trusting environment. You have a, a talent in that. You enable us to be curious, to be vulnerable, to be open and safe. And I appreciate that about you. And thank you for our friendship. Talk about incredible friendship. I appreciate you and the work that you're doing for the community by bringing out generosity and making that a forefront for the, for the world. So I appreciate you. ROG takeaway tip. How to apply what we've learned to our own work and lives. Number one, answer the question, what's your narrative? Meaning, What's the story you tell yourself about yourself? What just came to mind? Did you think about the roles you play? Did you think about your title and organization? When you think about your narrative, do you think about your disabilities or life challenges? Answering the question, who are you, is a question that anyone who is curious and courageous enough can explore for a lifetime. Guess who said this quote? Many years ago, but not so long ago, There were those who said, well, you have three strikes against you. You're black, you're blind, and you're poor. But God said to me, I will make you rich in the spirit of inspiration to inspire others as well as create music to encourage the world to a place of oneness and hope and positivity. I believed him and not them. Stevie Wonder. Number two, Consider how well you receive the good, the compliments, praise, and acknowledgement. When you're recognized, what do you do? Deflect? I didn't do anything. It was all my team. Deny? Are you kidding me? It was nothing. Divert? No, you're amazing. What's something others have acknowledged about you that you haven't received? Think back to it. What's true about what they said? Now, don't feel shame about whatever response you gave them when you first heard it, because until today, you may not have known that accepting their gift is kindness toward the gift giver. It's a positive way to recognize your self-worth. So next time someone offers you the gift of recognition and appreciation, please simply say, thank you. Lastly, pay attention to your blind spots. Take Licky's assessment, the link is in the show notes, Ask for feedback from others and pay closer attention to the things that you think about, ways that you behave, and habits that you hold. And don't judge them, just notice them. Just like driving a car, we need to look for our blind spots to keep us out of trouble. Our three takeaway tips this week is to think about your personal narrative, accept the gifts of recognition and love offered to you, and look for your blind spots. Until next week, stay generous, everyone. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. 
please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.